Ladies and gentlemen, we're here on the Sports Report, the number one global sports show, and as we do each and every Sunday here on Sportinarium, to kick things off, one of the greatest players in St. Joseph's Long Island Golden Eagles men's basketball history, that 2018-19 season where he put it all together, where he was third in the Skyline Conference in block shots, 13th in rebounds. He's now an integral reason as to why our L.I. Brew crew. Won the 2020 ABA St. Louis Cardinals Division Championship, and they're getting ready to kick off the season. In fact, they even kicked off just a little while ago. So obviously, it's a tremendous honor. And most importantly, we're celebrating our one-year anniversary together here this week on the Sports Report. So without further ado here on the Sports Report, the number one global sports show, the Boot Boss, Brad Weiss. My friend, happy anniversary. Happy anniversary, Tom. It's been uh, 53 episodes, certainly some great ones, and I'm so honored to have been on this show for a full year. Time does fly, though, Tom, but we're still here talking all the latest in the world of sports. Think about it, the brute force. When we first started, we were just at the beginning of the pandemic here with COVID-19, and nobody thought that a year later we would still be dealing with it, and we would see what has happened in the world. And But yet here we are, we're stronger, we're getting bigger and better each and every week on the sports report and we're on sport and area obviously the number one global radio station so cannot thank enough everybody that has supported us through and through throughout the entire time that you've been on the show and over our two years of existence here so it's been a tremendous honor to have you on for as long as we have and we're looking forward to the next year we're looking forward to those next two for the price of ones and we're looking forward to the future but the brute force to kick things off here it just happened a few days ago, and we're talking about the NBA trade deadline. The NBA trade deadline came and went, but the brute force, I think it left a lot more to be desired than usual. So for a worldwide audience here on Sportinarium, talk about some of the big moves that was in this year's NBA trade deadline. What an interesting trade deadline this year because we had a lot of people moving specifically from Florida to other places or to Florida in the opposite direction. And we'll start with those Florida teams. First in Orlando, where the Orlando Magic, who are 15 and 29 this season, have given up our hopes on their team and have completely shipped away three of their best players, including their all-star this year, Nikola Vucevic, who is headed to the Chicago Bulls to join Zach Levine and another all-star in Zach Levine and certainly going to make the Chicago Bulls a team to be reckoned with. Bulls traded away Otto Porter, Wendell Carter Jr., and two first-round picks in order to get Nikola Vucevic. And Vucevic is definitely a great player. And Alf Rukaminu also came from Orlando to Chicago. Now, another guy leading Orlando is Aaron Gordon. He's headed to the Denver Nuggets, a team that is definitely formidable. Who will lose two big pieces in Gary Harris and RJ Hampton in this trade, as well as a first-round pick. But Denver has been playing well lately, 26-18 and 18 record, fifth in the West. They're not first in the West like Alec Willis once said on this show, but they are definitely making progress. And certainly the addition of Aaron Gordon, who's going to play alongside veteran Paul Millsap, is certainly a great combination for a Denver team who looks definitely like they have an opportunity, especially with the Lakers having been injured with two of their big players not playing at the moment. And then also with the Orlando Magic, they traded guard Evan Fournier to the aforementioned Alec Willis' Boston Celtics, as well as my good friend Matt heard both Celtics fans definitely going to help them as he was averaging 20 points a game and the Celtics traded him for two second round picks so I thought it was a pretty good trade for Boston and they certainly will get help on the shooting aspect of things with Fournier they did give up Daniel Tice which I was quite surprised about Tom Bryce they got Mo Wagner in a three-way deal with Washington and a few other guys went other ways in this trade and then on the other side of Florida in Miami Miami acquired Victor Oladipo from the Houston Rockets it's a guy who's been traded so many times at this point. And this season, this will be his third team. But Miami is certainly a place where we feel like Oladipo can certainly have some success with the amount of coaching and the way that they run things. I think Oladipo is a nice fit for them. They did trade Avery Bradley and Kelly. Linux in order to get him as well as a 2022 draft swap, but it will help them. And the Miami Heat are also favorites to get Lamarcus Aldridge, who got bought out by San Antonio. And they did add forward Bielitsa from 
the Sacramento Kings as well, who's a very solid player. So Tom Rice, the state of Florida with Orlando and certainly Miami has been quite busy in this trade deadline. And even the other team who's currently in Florida and who will stay there for the rest of the season, the Toronto Raptors, a.k.a. Tampa Bay Raptors, have been busy as well. Bruce Force, though, speaking of the Toronto Raptors, and there was a player that we thought was going to be moved, but wound up not being moved. And talk about for our worldwide audience listening here on Sportinary, why you think that Kyle Lowry wasn't traded by the Raptors? Yeah, well, according to what I've heard, there wasn't a good enough deal for Lowry. And in order to get him out, they were going to have to obviously get some compensation. And Kyle Lowry is an aging point guard, obviously a guy who's been a champion before recently with the Toronto Raptors. But his contract is ending at the end of the year. He will be a free agent. And according to multiple sources, he was fine with staying with Toronto for the rest of the season and testing free agency. So it's certainly interesting, but we'll see. And Toronto, as bad as they've been this year, Tom, Bryce, 18 and 26. They're only a game and a half behind the Chicago Bulls for a playing spot. So they're not out of it. But they did make an interesting trade as they traded guard Norman Powell to the Portland Trailblazers. But they received some good players in return. And Gary Trent Jr., a young player who's definitely establishing himself in the NBA. And Rodney Hood, who is a great forward as well, who's very versatile. So I actually like that deal for the Toronto Raptors as they are right now out of the playoff picture in the Eastern Conference. But they do have a chance if they get hot here and keeping Lowry and keeping these pieces here that they've gotten in the trade will certainly help them improve. They did also trade away a shooter in Matt Thomas to the Utah Jazz like Utah needed any more shooting as they have been shooting the ball lights out. And speaking of shooters, Tom Bryce, J.J. Redick, the three-point shooting machine, is now headed to Dallas from the New Orleans Pelicans and is certainly going to help out Brendan Fitzpatrick's Mavericks, who have been up and down this season but have been playing well as of late. Redick will go with Niccolo Melli from the New Orleans Pelicans to Dallas for James Johnson, Wes Awandu, second round pick. So I think that that move right there, it's going to be great for the Mavericks. It's definitely going to make them a better team. And speaking of teammates that weren't traded that we were surprised, in New Orleans, Lonzo Ball was not traded as the Knicks were actually in the conversation for Lowry or Ball. But neither of them were traded and both of them will be free agents at the end of the year, Tom. So it's going to be quite interesting to see whether those guys change teams or whether these teams in the Raptors and Pelicans believe in them enough to re-sign them at the end of the season. And the Toronto Raptors also move Norman Powell. And that's another interesting move, to say the least. But I was curious also, the brute force, because we've talked a lot about good New York Knicks, which have obviously been a hot topic across the league. And what did the Knicks do this trade deadline? Because the Knicks, we know, were kind of in somewhat of an important move. It was certainly an interesting move, to say the least. So talk about what the Knicks did for our worldwide audience listening here on Sportinary. Yeah, so it's certainly interesting because the New York Knicks were expected to make a move, maybe not a big flashy one, but certainly a solid move for a decent player. You know, a couple of these names that we had mentioned, they were in the conversation for, but they ultimately were not going to get those players. But they did end up getting themselves involved in a three-team trade between them, the Philadelphia 76ers, and the Oklahoma City Thunder. The Knicks traded away Austin Rivers, and a former young player in Ignis Brazdakis, who's been on the G League team for the most part, and someone on the NBA team. They trade them away in a deal in which the Knicks end up getting guard Terrence Ferguson from Oklahoma City, as well as a center in Poirier from the Philadelphia 76ers, who they are going to be releasing because they want to keep an open roster spot. Ferguson is definitely a solid player from Oklahoma City. Kind of reminds me a little bit of a guy like Alec Burks, who's been playing very well for the Knicks. So he can definitely add versatility. The big part of this deal, though, was the Philadelphia 76ers got veteran point guard George Hill. And that's a huge thing for a team that is looking very serious this year, led by Long Island's own Tobias Harris here at the moment, as well as Danny Green with all his champion experience experience and Joel Embiid is injured but they're still playing well with him out of the lineup Ben Simmons has played well and the one thing that you question with them is enough depth and certainly George Hill an experienced a veteran point guard is going to help the Philadelphia 76ers and Oklahoma City in this deal got Austin Rivers from the Knicks got Tony Bradley from the 76ers and got two second round picks in 2025-2026 and the Oklahoma City Thunder Tom Bryce have draft picks on draft picks on draft picks for times and years to come. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, boy, they're going to have a lot of young players. I mean, they got draft picks that the Knicks won't have in, you know, maybe 30 years. They have so many in the next six to seven years. So it's going to be interesting to see what they do. But ultimately, the Knicks got a solid player. Philadelphia got a veteran. And Oklahoma City continues to build their draft equity in picks in order to get out of this rut that they're in at the moment and make themselves a contender in future years to come. I'll tell you one thing, the brute force, the Oklahoma City Thunder are definitely going to be on the clock. I think we're going to see a lot of draft picks from the Oklahoma City Thunder, certainly in this year's draft, in the next couple of years' draft. So I think that the Oklahoma City Thunder, pretty quickly, we'll get to see how this all shapes out for them. And the Knicks, again, are in a very interesting predicament. This is the first time we can honestly say the Knicks are true contenders, true playoff contenders. And with another win, the Knicks are over 500. So they're in this log jam once again in the Eastern Conference conference, which is narrowed a little bit. So I think that that's going to be interesting to see. And we'll continue to cover that here over the last several weeks of the season. But the brew for us, for our worldwide audience listening here on Sportinarium, give us first a few of your losers in this year's NBA trade deadline, and then give us maybe a few of your winners. Yeah, so the first clear loser, obviously, is the Orlando Magic. I mean, this is a team that a lot of people saw, especially after the last couple of years, they've made the playoffs. Maybe not a higher seed, but, you know, seventh or eighth seed, and they had a solid group of players in Fournier and Gordon and also Vucevic, amongst others. They had a decent group and a solid coach in Steve Clifford, and you really would have thought that they would have established some identity by now. And unfortunately, a year like this one, they have not gotten expectations and they've crashed everything down. Ultimately, they have to be the biggest disappointment. Now, one of the most positive teams out of all this is definitely multiple teams have gotten better, including the Chicago Bulls, who I mentioned earlier. The Miami Heat, I feel like with Oladipo, will be better, and they have more depth. Even if they add LaMarcus Aldridge, they're going to definitely add a lot of depth at that forward position. Another two teams, surprisingly, Tom Bryce, who actually, I think, made a good deal, is the Hawks and the Clippers, two teams that you know maybe you wouldn't have seen trading with each other but Rajon Rondo goes to the Clippers and Lou Williams goes to the Hawks and Williams is, is an Atlanta native who's played there before and the Hawks team that needs scoring right now and a guy like Williams coming off the bench it helps Atlanta and a team like the Clippers needed point guard play behind Beverly the pesky point guard himself but certainly needed a playmaker and Rajon Rondo is sure that so they both definitely were winners when they made that trade with each other and then I think the Denver Nuggets are winners you know you look at Aaron Gordon is going to help their team tremendously and they also added another big man former Shaq a fool legend on the Denver Nuggets and that is JaVale McGee who is now back <laughs> with the Denver Nuggets when he was there a long time ago he was known for all his bloopers and like I said Shaq and the fools but he's gotten a lot better he's won two championships since with the Warriors and with the Lakers last season and so he's going to help Denver get that identity and that championship feel in there because they're very close. So I really do think that these deals for Denver are going to help them. I think Chicago's going to benefit. I like Brandon Fitzpatrick's Dallas Mavericks as winners as well. Even the Toronto Raptors in some degree are, but certainly Tom, the clear, clear loser is definitely the Orlando Magic. No question. I definitely think the Orlando Magic are going to be at the bottom of the Eastern Conference for quite a while. So I think as a Magic fan, it's going to be tough for the next few years. But I want to go back to the Toronto Raptors very quickly once again, because I know we've talked about them now a couple of different times. But you trade Norman Powell. I get that. But Kyle Lowry, you know, wants a big contract. I mean, if you look at where they are in the standings in the Eastern Conference, I guess you could say that they're still in it. The Celtics, as we talked about at the top, are in a free-for-all. The Pacers made a move, Victor Oladipo. Then you got the Bulls who made a trade that maybe that propels them, gets them maybe into an eighth spot or maybe even moves up into a ninth spot and continues to keep themselves at least in position for a play-in when it comes to the NBA playoffs. But if you're the Raptors and you're two years removed 
from winning an NBA championship. Kyle Lowry, I know, has meant a lot to the franchise, but you're probably not going to resign him based on age and performance. I mean, wouldn't you have felt the pressure to move him because you don't want to lose him for anything? I mean, talk to me about your thoughts on that. Yeah, absolutely, Tom. That's a great point. Obviously, them not trading Lowry, you feel like they lost some value there because, you know, you could have gotten something back in young talent, draft picks. That's the direction that the Raptors could have went in. But they decided ultimately that the packages that they were receiving just simply weren't enough for them. And in my case, I'm kind of surprised because I think any sort of value for him would have been the right move because of the fact that they're going to lose him, as you mentioned, most likely in the offseason. I don't think that they're planning on re-signing him. And it, you got to wonder where the Toronto Raptors are going in what direction, because they do have some of the nucleus there, like Pascal Siakam and Fred Van Fleet, who they just signed to a big contract, you know, amongst other players who are good, but they've lost a whole lot as well. And Kawhi Leonard, obviously. And now you, we mentioned Norman Powell earlier, a bunch of other players, you know, like Serge Ibaka and Marcus Saul, who were there when they won a championship. So they've lost a lot. And you wonder whether or not, not, not getting rid of Lowry, not getting this opportunity before he gets into free agency, hurt them or help them because you don't know what direction they're going in. So it's quite interesting. They're in Tampa Bay this year, Tom Bryce. So maybe that's throwing them off. <laughs> they're, they're long away from Toronto. So we'll see if they get back into shape when they get back to Toronto. This year in Tampa Bay, I would be surprised if they snuck into the playoffs at this point. They still can, but in the end, they're not going to get very far. And ultimately, we have to see what direction they really are going in. Tampa Bay Raptors. Maybe we should call them the Tampa Bay Raptors at this point. I mean, it actually rings pretty good. I mean, it actually rolls off the tongue. So maybe that's the name that we should call them. But I want to bring up one more trade here as we close this recap of the NBA trade deadline that just passed this Thursday. And it was a flurry of activity. Probably one of the more most recent years of activity that we've seen the NBA trade deadline in quite a while. But there was one trade that was intriguing to me because I don't know necessarily how it helped either team. I mean, certainly for one team, I could maybe make the argument for a little more help in. And that was the trade involving the Hawks and Clippers. And two teams right now that are going in similar directions. And the Atlanta Hawks right now look like they're primed and poised to make a pretty big run here in the second half. And we had talked about them about a month ago as a team that we thought was a big disappointment. But they're coming on here really strong, the brute force. They have a good chance to move up here, continue to the Eastern Conference. And the Los Angeles Clippers who perennially seem to be at the top of the Western Conference, but never seem to be able to get through the door. But the trade between the Hawks and Clippers of Lou Williams for Rajon Rondo and a second round draft pick. I mean, what do you think about this trade? It's two veteran players. Obviously, Lou Williams, one of the greatest all-time scorers off the bench. Rajon Rondo, obviously one of the great point guards of our generation. But what did you make of this trade? And do you think there's one team that actually benefited more than the other? other with this? You know, it's quite interesting and obviously I touched upon it earlier but certainly I think these teams really needed both of these players and I think that the swap was actually good because of the fact that both players in their respective positions before they got traded probably weren't playing as much as they are going to be for their team that they're getting traded or two I should say. Certainly when it comes to Rajon Rondo, he really wasn't playing in Atlanta and we all know he was injured for a majority of the time but you know, Trey Young is their point guard and they tend to be a team that's high offensively when you talk about the Atlanta Hawks. And I see a guy like Lou Williams really fitting into that formula, being able to score. And you look at the Atlanta Hawks, you say, oh, they got a solid starting five. But then you look at the bench and you're like, wait a second, where's the scoring off the bench? And certainly Lou Williams is going to answer that question. And he's certainly going to get some more playing time. As I mentioned earlier, he's a hometown kid from Atlanta. So he's going to really be happy to be back. And he's already played for the franchise. And Nate McMillan, Millen, like I have said on multiple occasions, who was an excellent coach in Indiana, they got rid of for really no reason, in my opinion, was the assistant in Atlanta. And obviously he's gotten the job since the coach of Atlanta got fired. And he's done a tremendous job with this Atlanta Hawks team. And I think Lou Williams is really going to compliment well. And then of course, with the Clippers and Rondo, I mean, they needed a point guard. They needed a guy to compliment Patrick Beverly. They needed a guy who could make plays for guys like Kawhi Leonard and Paul George, amongst others. They have so much score but they don't have that true playmaker at the point guard position. So I think Rondo and Lou Williams, both who are on solid teams, switching actually benefits both teams, Tom. And I think it was a pretty good deal for both sides. I'll tell you one 
Something to brute force. The Atlanta Hawks and the Los Angeles Clippers are two very intriguing teams right now in the NBA. And you could definitely make a case for either of these teams at this point to maybe make a run deep into the postseason. The Atlanta Hawks, I think they might benefit from this trade just as much as the Los Angeles Clippers. Because if you think about it, Lou Williams, his veteran experience, his veteran scoring off the bench. So I think that they could benefit just as much as the Clippers because Rajon Rondo goes to a veteran team, a team that's in line to win a championship and his experience he gets more playing time so it looks to me like a win-win for both teams just like it's a win-win for the sports report the number one global sports show with our number one analyst around for all the latest happenings in the world of sports and we're celebrating our one year anniversary of him here and we're talking about none other than the brute force brad weiss one of the greatest players in sjc low island golden eagles men basketball history as i am the host of the sports report the reverend Tom Bryce. And for more information on the Sports Report, you can go to soundcloud.com slash the Sports Report 2019, where you can listen to many of our archives with myself and the Brute Force. You can subscribe now to our YouTube page at the Sports Report, the number one global sports show, where you can find all of our Sunday shows with the Brute Force and his teammate, Googs, Jake Guggenheimer of our LA Brew Crew, as we do each and every Sunday, our Brew Crew Hour and Rob Maraska. So all things related to the Sports Report, you can now also go to our YouTube page at the Sports Report the number one global sports show and definitely give us a subscribe give us a like on all of our videos and clips and continue to spread the word as always a huge shout out to the entire team here at Sportinarium including Lakey, Arv, Sean who does a phenomenal job with the YouTube page at Sportinarium TV Steve, Richie, Susie, Sasha, Connor, Martin, Ryan everybody at Sportinarium that has made us the number one global sports show 80, Dale, Dave, Mike Lipinski our old friend from the Section 247 show does a phenomenal a job with the In the Fight show you can hear now on Sportinarium. It is a long list of people at Sportinarium and we can never thank them enough for all that they do for us. So we're extremely grateful for all the support and friendship of our friends at Sportinarium. And you can follow Sportinarium on Twitter and Instagram at Sportinarium. You can like Sportinarium on Facebook at Sportinarium Media. And most importantly, you can listen to the Sports Report Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays, 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 10 p.m. to 12 a.m. UK Time on Sportinarium.com. That's Fridays, Saturdays, Saturdays and Sundays, 6 to 8 p.m., Fridays to Sundays, and then 10 p.m. to 12 a.m. on Sportinarium.com. And you can always like the Sportinarium YouTube page by subscribing to at Sportinarium TV, where you can find a who's who of sports report interviews and some of the other great shows that we have here on Sportinarium in 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. You can listen to Sportinarium.com, where you can find a who's who of shows out there, the Spartan Show, In the Fight, Women's Fight News, All That Racket, so many great shows that we have here in Sportinarium 80s Music, Sean's Mix, DJ Slippy with Dale, I mean, the Sunday Chill Out Session, which I kind of promo for, so everybody needs to go to Sportinarium.com anytime, anywhere, and most importantly, Fridays to Sundays, 6 to 8 p.m., 10 p.m. to 12 a.m. UK time on Sportinarium.com. You can always listen to the Sports Report Fridays to Sundays, and also a huge shout-out to the LI Brew Crew, and everybody on Instagram needs to keep up to date with the boys by going to Instagram and giving a follow to at LI Brew Crew, as we know the season Season's already started. We cannot wait to recap Sunday's games with the Brute Force and Goose. We're going to air that on Sportinarium.com tomorrow. So you know what you need to do. We have a special wish for a Brute Crew player coming up at the end of the segment here. So looking forward to doing that. And we are here on the Sports Report, the number one global sports show, kicking off today's show by celebrating our one-year anniversary with the Brute Force, Brad Weiss of our LA Brute Crew, talking all things related to the world of professional sports and the Brute Force. For our world audience listening here on sport name i gotta ask you did your bracket burst yet <laughs> oh yeah it bursted tom bryson boy has it been a crazy year of madness especially in the world but certainly in march madness because boy was there so many upsets so many unpredictable things that we've seen but that's what's made it so entertaining tom and that's what makes ncaa division one men's basketball brackets so entertaining every single year of course some of the crazy stories in the bracket is from a team here in new york who i did not expect to get this far so far to the sweet 16 and that's the syracuse Orange, who are the number 11 seed, and they beat San Diego State, the number six 
safety, and then the number three seed, Duncan Robinson, guys who should shoot the three ball at a high rate. This guy's unbelievable and has led Syracuse all the way to the Sweet 16. Oral Roberts. Who is Oral Roberts, Tom Bryce? But boy, they are telling us who they are. They have beaten number two, Ohio State, and number seven, Florida. And big man Kevin O'Banner has been straight balling. He has been unbelievable and leading them to this point where they're going to play number three, Arkansas, who beat, of course, my pick to win, Texas Tech, 68 to 66, where Texas Tech had so many opportunities to win that game, but they did not. And ultimately, that really busted my bracket. A couple of things that also busted people's brackets was Loyola Chicago taking down another team from their state in Illinois, the number one seed that everybody had winning. And certainly, Sister Jean in Loyola Chicago were quite happy with the result as they took a 71 to 58 win against Illinois. Abilene Christian pulled off an upset against Texas 53 to 52, and that was a 14 and 3 matchup. But Abilene Christian did lose to UCLA, who advanced, of course. So as we get here, Tom, we are now in the Sweet 16 as we speak. Number one, Gonzaga is going to take on number five, Creighton. Number six, USC is going to take on number seven, Oregon in the West. In the East, number one, Michigan, who I have in some other brackets that I made, are facing number four, Florida State, as well as Alabama, the number two seed, facing number 11, the UCLA. And in the South region, number one, Baylor takes on number five, Villanova, as well as a game I just mentioned, Arkansas and Oral Roberts, number three against number 15 in the South. And then finally, in the Midwest region, number eight, Loyola Chicago against number 12, Oregon State, who has been quite impressive as well. And number two, Houston will face number 11 Syracuse from our home state here in New York so it is going to be quite interesting to see this sweet 16 go down and next week on the show we will see what happens as we get closer to the championship game and of course as we continue to go we'll also have the women's side who have just started and we'll have more on the results on that side as we see our UConn Huskies and see if that side works when it comes to my brackets so we'll see all that next week Tom and the madness should now continue (laughs) The madness will definitely continue. And obviously, everyone was looking at you and said, why did the Brew Force pick Texas Tech? But to be fair, the Brew Force, I think everybody this year who picked a bracket probably doesn't have a bracket left at this point. So there was a lot of upsets, a lot of exciting games. I enjoyed the format this year. I actually liked the Friday to Monday format. It was a welcome addition. I've always not been a fan of that Thursday to Sunday thing. I kind of liked it this year, that Friday and Monday. It's spaced it out better. I like the whole idea that every game ended at the same time so it wasn't like you had to stay up till two three in the morning everything ended right around the same time so i thought it was job well done after last year missing the tournament if you think about where we were in the world that was right around when the pandemic started the tournament canceled and postponed and this year we get to have that so i think we're very excited to at least see the nta tournament in its format obviously there's been some disappointments where there's been some games postponed due to covid and a couple of teams going into the tournament had to postpone their season but i think by and large it's been pretty successful and we're happy to have basketball back but the brew force before we get your closing thoughts we've alluded to it here and that the boys have started the season we're looking forward to recapping obviously the games here with you and googs and we'll do that tomorrow for our worldwide audience on sportinarium but thoughts about some of the keys here for sunday's game and how does it feel to be back on the field yeah tom it feels great to be back on the field and boy did we have a lot of fun in last week's scrimmage getting ready for our game today against the angry pirates we played at Canning Hats <laughs> Park in Hicksville. And of course, everybody knows from some of my previous talks is that Hicksville is certainly a place I like to play. So you guys make sure you hear about how I did as well as my teammate Goose and the rest of the team. But in our scrimmage last week, Tom, it started off with a bang for me as I got a single and hit a home run in my <laughs> second half out of the scrimmage and certainly got my brain going. And certainly the entire brew crew was pretty much on fire. Our friend Googs here on the show, everybody will be listening to shortly in hockey. Got off to a little slow start, and I know he's going to get a little upset with me saying that. But he did redeem himself later in the day and definitely was raking when we got done and certainly will rake for us in the regular season. Not, you know, you don't need to in the scrimmage, Tom Bryce, but certainly 
He's going to be a great player. And we have so many great players on this LI Brew Crew team. I cannot wait to play with all of them. We added Sal Kamasuli to the mix. And boy, is he another great player and a great athlete. So I can't wait, Tom Bryce, to talk some LI Brew Crew. And of course, be sure to listen to what we're going to call our LI Brew Crew post game show each and every week here on Sportinarium. We can't wait to continue pursuing another championship or two here in the spring and summer leagues. And we'll be sure to share all those great things with you here on the sports report looking forward to that and obviously we know that dudes is going to redeem himself and the boys are back in town and we know you guys are going to deliver us at least one if not two championships this year so the crew is definitely brewing and everybody needs to follow the boys on instagram at li brew crew and find out why they are the premier softball team around and why they are going to have the season that they had last year winning the 2020 aba st louis cardinals division championship so we'll looking forward to that and for you my friend i want to give you the floor i want to give any closing thoughts as always plug where our listeners can get in touch with you and i cannot thank you enough for all that you've done for us and congratulations on the one year anniversary you are an integral part as to why with the number one global sports show as to why we're on sportinarium heard in eight countries and have so many different supporters and talk with a who's who of people each and every week here on this show so you've been a big part of that my friend i want to thank you i want to congratulate you so the crew is brewing always each and every week when we get the brute force to kick things off on the Sunday show. So you know the drill, my friend. Plug with us to get in touch with you and the floor is yours, my friend. Yeah, Tom, thank you a lot. Of course, this is a special episode for me. One year on this show. I can't thank you enough for continuing to have me here talking all the latest in the world of sports and I hope to continue that for many more episodes as I continue my journey in coaching and getting back hopefully on the court, playing wise maybe a little bit, but definitely also on the softball field and continue to cover all the latest in the world of sports here on the sports report on Sportinarium. And I cannot thank all of our great listeners from the many countries that listen to us now here on the best global sports radio station around in Sportinarium. Cannot thank everyone enough for listening to my segment today and always. As I always want to do, I want to thank the frontline workers, doctors, nurses, delivery people, all the people on the front lines across the world who are the true heroes during this COVID-19 time. As we continue to progress, these people should be recognized because really, like I continue to say they are the true heroes and they have done some great work we cannot thank them enough of course my social media is at bweiss20 on instagram and snapchat and at bridewise20 on twitter and you want to definitely keep in contact with my instagram as i'm going to post some of the clips from one year ago when me and tom price spoke on the sports report so stay tuned with that and some of the archives of the show and some of the greatest things I post on my Instagram page at BYS20. As I always do, thank you to Sportinarium, the best global sports radio station around for having our entire team. Of course, Tom, Rob Maraska, Ernest Dove, Googs, my teammate, and of course, Craig Holman, all the great guys every weekend, Friday, Saturdays, and Sundays, 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern time. Can't thank them enough. As we get ready to kick off my AAU season as a coach, I cannot wait to get started with the Level Up family. And guess what? One of my teammates who's doing an amazing job coaching the Long Island Sound, my former teammate on the St. Joseph's Long Island Golden Eagles, Matt Hurd, we might be having a scrimmage this upcoming week. So I cannot <laughs> wait to get that started, Tom Bryce, and definitely go up against my former teammate and certainly get the kids better and on my seventh grade level of course you can follow his program at li sound basketball on instagram and make sure you follow the one i'm working for of course and that's level up who's doing an excellent job on instagram at level up underscore li and finally tom bryce as we mentioned with the brew crew we have a special happy birthday to give out and that is not only to a brew crew teammate of mine but he's one of my best friends he's a great guest here on the show for us and certainly is one of my favorite teammates of all time that I've played with in basketball and baseball and that's Brendan Fitzpatrick and now we're on the softball field dominating and also we're the top refing tandem in Nassau County at the moment so we certainly have had so many great memories I cannot thank Brendan enough for always being on my side and being one of my best friends and certainly one of the best point guards I've ever played with so cannot thank Brendan enough and certainly We'll definitely hear him back on the Sports Report very soon because he's certainly going to come on with some brew crew talk and even some analysis. We'll make sure he gets back on. Cannot wait for that. Be sure to follow us on Instagram at LI Brew Crew to cover not only Brendan and myself, but the rest of the team 
my teammate Jake Guggenheimer, who you're going to hear from amongst the rest of the crew, getting ready for a season. And we're definitely excited to get back on the field. And we'll have it every week on Sportinarium, our post-game show, covering what happened each and every week on the Brew Crew field. Cannot thank you enough, Tom, for another great week of New York's number one sports show and the global number one sports show, and that's the sports report. It's been one year, but I can't wait for many more years to come. And certainly, I can't wait for this show to continue to, to grow. And Sportinarium, thank you, as always, for making us now the global number one sports show. And I cannot wait to do it again next week. Rising tide lifts all boats. And ladies and gentlemen, the birthday boy, Brendan Fitzpatrick, is one of the biggest rising tides that we have out there. He's Plainview's favorite son. MJF has nothing on Fitzy and the Fitz magic that he brings not only to the court, but also to the diamond with our LA Brew Crew. He's one of the most important guests in sports report history, one of the most colorful and energetic guests in show history. And we know that he's going to be celebrating a great birthday. And we want to make sure that he remembers this for years to come and cannot wait to watch it, my friend, on the field later this year. Cannot wait to see you do bigger and better things as a coach. We know that you're on your way to greatness and i hope you have a happy birthday i hope you have many more birthdays ahead looking forward to seeing you later this year congratulations and happy birthday to of our Allied Brew Crew. So ladies and gentlemen, I don't think we have anything else more to say. I don't think anybody's birthday wish can top that one when it comes to Brendan Fitzpatrick. So Brew Force, may the force be with you and the rest of the forces, including the Super Force, the Strong Force, the Special Force, and the Gentle Force. Congratulations on the one-year anniversary. Looking forward to the next anniversary. Looking forward to the next week. Don't go too hard on our good friend, Matt Hurt. He's been one of our biggest supporters and we love our Golden Eagles. We love you teammates so let's hope that that practice and that scrimmage goes well and congratulations and we'll speak with you next week tom thank you as always one year and let's go goose give us all the latest in the world of hockey as we're here on the sports report the number one bubble sports show with the brute force brad weiss one of the greatest players in sjc long island golden eagles men basketball history and one of the integral parts of our li Brew crew the 2020 aba st louis Cardinal division champions who have started the season and also coach with the level up basketball organization one of the top organizations around when it comes to basketball on the round as i am the host of the sports report the reverend tom bryce and stay tuned for more hard hitting analysis here on the sports report as the brew crew hour continues with Googs, Jake Googs, and I'm going to talk all the latest happenings in the world of the NHL as I am the host of the Sports Report, the Reverend Tom Bryce, and we're here on Sportinarium, the number one global radio station, as we were just with the brute force, Brad Weiss, here on Sportinarium. And stay tuned for Googs, Jake Googs, and I'm going to talk all the latest happenings in the world of the NHL. As we're here on the Sports Report, the number one global sports show, and after just hearing from his teammate on the LI Brute Crew. The brute force, Brad Weiss. You know, it's that time to bring him in here. And of course, he's an integral reason as to why our LA Brew Crew won the 2020 ABA St. Louis Cardinals Division Championship. And he was also a three-time Canadian National Baseball Champion with our McGill Redbirds. And he's the top analyst around when it comes to the world of the NFL and the NHL. And without further ado here on the Sports Report, the number one global sports show, Googs, Jake Guggenheimer. My friend, how are you? I'm great, Tommy. You know, I, I always love uh, this segment we do. I, I love talking hockey, and especially when I get the opportunity to talk to someone like you who genuinely brightens up the world. I, I love it. So I, I'm really looking <laughs> forward to delving into this week. I think both our New York teams had pretty solid week here, and uh, it should be a fun one to talk about. Absolutely, and the two Metro teams definitely did that because the Sabres at this point were just kind of glancing over them at this point because I think the Sabres have pretty much said, we're waving the white flag and, and the season is over. But certainly when it comes to the Rangers and Islanders, there's a lot to be excited about. And let's start off with our Rangers, Jake, because the Rangers now on a three-game winning streak. And I think for the first time this season, you can honestly say that the Rangers are on a run and they're looking like the team that we saw right before the pandemic last year. And Jake, I think also at this point going forward for the rest of the season, the Rangers should just keep playing the Philadelphia Flyers. 
I would love it if they played the Philadelphia <laughs> Flyers the rest of the season. And, you know, it, it is at the Flyers' expense, and it, it's kind of tough to see, unfortunately, for a pretty storied franchise in Philadelphia. But, I mean, the last two games against Philly have been just awesome hockey to see. 17 goals in two games against Philly. So I love it, and I feel bad for Philly. But, I mean, as a Ranger fan, you love to see it, and then you want them to keep pouring it on every opportunity you get. Absolutely. Listen, Jake, 17 goals in two games. I remember if – you were a team and you scored 17 goals in, let's say, a week and a half. That would be good. That would be normal. But yet the Rangers, here they are, have scored 17 goals the last two games they've played against the Philadelphia Flyers and with another one coming up here. And Jake, I got to say, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about Mika Zibanejad. We were like, ah, oh, what's wrong with him? He's having a bad season. All of a sudden now, you look at his stats and you say, ah, oh, 26 points in 31 games. That's what two natural hat tricks can do in two games with six points or more. I mean, listen, Jake, now, all of a sudden, Mika's advantage as the player that we saw last year. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think you can obviously point to these two games and say they've inflated his point total. You would be <laughs> correct if you said that. But I mean, you got to look at the body of work he's been putting in over the period of time, you know, since we started talking about how integral he is to this Rangers lineup. And he's getting stronger on the puck earlier in the season. He was losing a lot of those 50-50 chances. He was getting beat to pucks, which you don't typically see with his advantage. He's a very fast skater and he's quick on his feet. So, you know, he's making those plays. His passes are sharper. He's really forechecking well. He's getting in on the rush and he's in the right place at the right time, which is exactly what he was doing last year. You don't score two natural hat-tricks, two hat-tricks for that matter, by luck. You got to be in the right place at the right time, taking the right shots, you know, placing the puck well. And he's been on a quite a stretch these last couple of games, especially, you know, he played well against Washington in the game they won last Sunday. And obviously these two games against Philly have been spectacular. But ultimately, I think he's getting back into form. And this is the Mika Zibanejad we saw last year that we all kind of knew and loved and were hoping for it from the get-go this season but you know better late than never it's good to see him getting some points up on the board scoring and being involved in the offense and hopefully this continues because Rangers hockey is more fun when Zibanejad is contributing. Absolutely and last year we talked about it a few weeks ago Jake for our worldwide audience listening here on Sport Name. I mean Zibanejad was one of the best goal scorers in the entire league so now we're seeing the player that we saw last year that was on pace to have one of the best seasons in team history when it comes to goals and another player that we talked about here a couple of weeks ago, Jake, and we've talked about him over the past several shows here, is Ryan Strom. And Ryan Strom had four points against the Flyers here in this eight-goal barrage, once again, that the Rangers had on the Flyers. And I gotta say, Jake, at this point, I don't know if the Rangers should trade Ryan Strom because if the Rangers are now in the mix and getting a shot at maybe getting back into the postseason, I gotta think Ryan Strom's gonna play a key role in this team. And four points against the Flyers makes me think, uh, I don't know if I'd want to move him at the moment. I mean, I told you I thought that was going to happen in the offseason anyway, if he was to get moved. Look, he's a point per game guy. He's got 30 points, 11 goals, 19 assists. I mean, We talked about how I think he benefits a little bit from being on that line with Panarin, as many players do, but he was in the right place tonight. He got a pass right in front of the net. Panarin put it right on his stick and Strom just directed it into the net. And that's pretty much all they're going to ask for from guys. They're playing on a line with a guy who can place the puck that nicely. So look, I mean, goal scoring is hard to come by in the NHL and it's even harder to find guys who also contribute in other ways on the offense, whether that be assists or, you know, even just filling holes. So look, Strom's an integral part of this team. He's the second leading point scorer on this team with 30 points. Like we said, 11 goals, 19 assists. He is a net plus, plus six. He contributes on the power play. He wins face-offs if he's asked to take them, which he is. And look, I, I mean, what more can you really ask from a guy? I think he's doing a everything he can to build up his trade value, which is exactly what we need him to do. Um, <laughs> hopefully they can flip him for something in the off season, a younger piece. But look, if it comes to the point where we're keeping Ryan Strom and he continues up with this production, as much as I may have my quarry with him as a, as a player, you can't hate on production. So put the personal feelings aside and just look at numbers. And Ryan Strom is doing a great job for the Rangers this year. Listen, Jake, Ryan Strom is still a young player. And I'm almost envious now at this point because we had him obviously with the Islanders and with the Islanders we were hoping to see the 
player that the Rangers have in Ryan Strom, and we never really got to see it. We had flashes where he scored 50 points back in the 2016 season, but for whatever reason, he couldn't stay consistently in the lineup, and unfortunately, that was kind of the Islanders' luck when it comes to first-round draft picks, especially as high as Ryan Strom was drafted after drafting John Tavares, as the Islanders did with the number one pick. You're thinking, all right, Ryan Strom, first-round pick, is right in the top 10. We're going to get a player that's going to be just like John Tavares in terms of offensive production. But we are now seeing that with the Rangers. But Jake, you also brought up Panarin. And Panarin's got 29 points in 21 games. And we talked about this a couple of weeks ago when Panarin came back into the lineup for the Rangers. And I think at this point now, Panarin's the kind of guy that can help everybody else around him. And we're starting to see that now over the past week, week and a half with the Rangers. And I really think Panarin might have more leadership, believe it or not, off the ice and on the ice because of the lift that I think he's given this team right now. Artemi Panarin will be the New York Rangers' next captain. If it does not happen at some point during this season, it will happen in the offseason. That man does everything in his power to will his team to victory every night. And this is not Rangers by speaking. Panarin was fantastic in Chicago. He was fantastic in Columbus. He's been just absolutely fantastic since he came over to New York. I mean, 29 points in 21 games is ridiculous. And we talked about how much the Rangers were missing his offensive facilitation when he was out for those couple weeks. But since he's come back, they've been on a roll. They've been scoring goals. They've been passing the puck around a lot. Their power play looks a lot better. Their spacing on the ice is a lot better. And that's what a a star player can do for you. And I'm sure the Islanders are kind of gritting their teeth saying we could have had this guy. I mean, they offered him more money, but he signed with the Rangers anyway because he he wanted to play for the Rangers. And look, as a Ranger fan, I'm ecstatic with how he's been. As a hockey fan, it's such a pleasure to see him play. I mean, he is so technically sound. He is always in the right place at the right time. His He always always makes the right pass. He can shoot the puck, but it's not his first priority. His first priority is facilitating. When you have a guy who's scoring over a point per game, that type of production is hard to come by. And we were talking about this off the air, Tommy. He's got more multi-point games this year than he does points than he does games with one point. And he's got more games with one point than he has games with no points at all. So the guy has more games this season with two points than he does with no points. And that's a statistic you marvel at when you're looking at a hockey player. You know, he's only a plus eight. And I think that has to do with a little bit of how the Rangers were playing early in the season, but that number is going to continuously increase the more he's on the ice and 21 games, 29 points is just unheard of production. Absolutely. And Jake, the only other player that you can think about that has that type of production of 1.4 points per game is a guy named Connor McDavid. And Jake, I've gotten to watch a lot of the superstars across the league up close and in person. And when I've seen Panarin, whether he was with the Blackhawks, or whether he was with Columbus and now with the Rangers, he's one of those five or six players that I would pay any amount of money to see. I don't know if he's McDavid, but he's certainly the next level under him and there's no question that he really makes a difference for this team that's why I had kind of thought Jake that when Panarin had come back to the lineup it was going to give the Rangers that jolt little did we know it was going to give that much of an offensive punch but speaking about the offensive punch to this team Jake and I really think it's important to note that the Rangers right now impressively have six players with 20 points or more including Adam Fox who right now has 26 points I mean you want to talk about unheard of Jake for our world I want to listen to here on Sport and Aaron. For a defenseman to be averaging almost a point a game, there's a handful of defensemen that do that. We're talking about rarefied air. And maybe, Jake, it's time to put Adam Fox in the Norris Trophy discussion. Adam Fox is 22 years old. Um, Adam Fox is 22 years old. He is so good defensively. And what he provides on offense is just a plus when it comes to everything he does defensively. He is a leader as well. That assistant captain will definitely be given to him, I think, in this offseason. He is a leader on that team. He is the number one defenseman as a 22-year-old, scoring 26 points in 31 games. He had five assists tonight. He was just all over the ice. He makes the defensive plays. He's terrific blocking shots. He's terrific on the back check. He is fast. He is skilled. He is great offensively. And it's just so fun to see his development. When the Rangers traded for him from Carolina, I think two years ago, I don't think anyone expected this. And he's really not going to get too much discussion when it comes to the Norris Trophy, just because a lot of the really good older defensemen in this league. Adam Fox is going to be a name that you're going to hear for years to come and get used to because that man is legit. 
definitely legit. And of course, your teammates on the Brew Crew know him very well, Jake and Kyle Subran, because they've talked about him on the air. So there's no question that Adam Fox is going to put himself in discussion one year at some point when it comes to the Norris Trophy. But he definitely deserves consideration now. But Jake, the Rangers are have a lot of momentum right now. They're three points back of the Bruins of that last spot when it comes to the postseason in the Eastern Division, the Mass Mutual East Division. The Rangers do have three games that they've played already that the Bruins have. So the Bruins will have a chance to make up some ground here and increase their lead over the Rangers. But in the meantime, three points back. They have games coming up here with the Capitals, with the Flyers, and with Buffalo, which we hope are gimmies at this point, considering Buffalo. We talked about that at the top here. But for the Rangers to continue the momentum and to continue this winning streak and to get themselves in that position, that fourth position, which Jake, right now, it's very possible the Rangers are not that far behind. What are the Rangers have to do to continue the momentum? Yeah, I think a couple you know, weeks ago, this was not looking as good as it is now, but getting Shesterkin back is huge. He played pretty well tonight. I mean, he gave up three goals, but listen, some of those goals were good shots and you just got to give it to Philly. And when you score an eight, if you give up three, it's really not that big of a deal. He played pretty well today. And I, I was happy with that. That's going to be a big key is solidifying that goal tending position. If you want my honest opinion, I think Georgiev gets traded and they're going to ride with Kincaid as their backup. He's actually played very well since he was inserted into the lineup. He's three, one and one with a two point. 2-2 goals against, like a 9-10 save percentage with a shutout. Uh, you can't really ask anything from your third string goaltender besides that. I wouldn't be surprised if we saw Georgiev get traded and, and they solidify that Shosturk and Kincaid rotation. And then they just got to keep getting scoring. I mean, they, you, like you said, they have six guys with 20 plus points and those are their horses. Those are the guys you expect to be scoring. It's Buchnevich, it's Panarin, it's Zibanejad, Fox, it's Kreider. Those are the guys you want to see continue to put on the points there when they have the opportunities and then get a little bit of development from guys like Lafreniere, Keandre Miller, who scored tonight. Lafreniere as well scored tonight. You know, Capo Caco had two goals the other night. So that was big. You know, Truba has been playing really well lately since he came back from that thumb injury. So, you know, continually getting that offensive production from guys like this and, and also solidifying that goaltending rotation, like we've said many times on this show, is going to be very important to the Rangers success over the next week. And just one thing before we move on from the Rangers, I want to read you out some statistics and I want you to tell me which player you'd prefer on your team. Okay. Player A has three goals, 23 assists, 26 points. And player B has two goals, 16 assists, 18 points. Who would you prefer on your team if, if you were taking either of those two guys? I got to go with player A, Jake. I mean, that's a no-brainer. That's Adam Fox as player A and Jack Eichel as player B. So yeah, Jack Eichel's playing in Buffalo, but you're expecting more of this guy. And he's got two goals over the course of this season. And sure, he's missed some time, but you look at it and you wonder, is it, you know, is it Buffalo wasting his talent? Is Eichel struggling that much? But, you know, people talk a big game about Jack Eichel as a key piece in the Buffalo lineup, and he's really not producing as much this year. And Adam Fox has got 26 points as a young defenseman. And I think I'd ride with Adam Fox as well right now. And Adam Fox plays an entirely different position and he's not expected to shoulder the load when it comes to offensive scoring, whereas Jack Eichel, you're expecting him to be up there with Panarin. You're expecting him to be up there with Kane. You're expecting him to be up there with Crosby and Matthews and certainly McDavid. And yet, to hear that production, well, we can see why the Buffalo Sabres are where they are and we can certainly see why the New York Rangers are on the upwards and we're certainly on the upwards with our number one NHL analyst and that's Goods, Jake Goods. Guggenheimer of our L.I. Crew. Who have just started the season here, so we're definitely excited about that. The crew is definitely brewing. The crew is definitely brewing here with our Brew Crew Hour, as I am the host of the Sports Report, the Reverend Tom Bryce. And for more information on the Sports Report, you can go to sportsreportx.com. And to listen to all of our archives with myself and Googs, you can go to soundcloud.com slash the Sports Report 2019, and you can catch all of our Sunday shows now on YouTube by subscribing to the Sports Report, the number one global sports show that's at the Sports Report, the number one global sports show where you can catch all the Sunday shows and sports report related material with myself, Googs, the Brute Force, Brad Weiss, and the rest of the team here. And as always, a huge shout out to the entire team here at Sportinary, including Lakey, R, Sean, who does a great job with the YouTube page, Susie, Sasha, Connor, Martin, Steve, Richie, Dave, Dale, our friend Mike Lipinski, who does a great job with the In the Fight Show. It is a long list of people here at Sportinary that make us the number one global radio station. And you can subscribe to the Sportinarium TV YouTube page at Sportinarium TV, where Sean does a phenomenal job. 
job and you can catch sports report related content and all things related to the sports report and the many great shows that are here on sport and area. I also want to recognize our very good friend DJ 80 who we cut a promo for for the Sunday chill out session which you can catch here right before we go on the air with the brew crew hour you can follow Sportinarium on Twitter and Instagram at Sportinarium and you can like Sportinarium on Facebook at Sportinarium Media and Friday Saturdays and Sundays most importantly 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern time 10 p.m. to 12 a.m. time you can listen to the sports report on Sportinarium.com and we are honored to be here on the Sportinarium the number one global radio station so that's Friday Saturdays and Sundays 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern time 10 p.m. to 12 a.m. Sportinarium.com you can catch the sports report and of course 24 hours a day seven days a week 365 days a year you can catch all of the many great shows here on Sportinarium all you have to do is go to Sportinarium.com so where we're not on you can go to In the Fight you can go to All That Racket you can go to the Sunday Chill Out Sessions you can go to the Spartan Show there's so many great shows all you gotta do is go to Sportinarium.com and as always a huge shout out to the LA Brew Crew want to make sure everybody follows the Brew Crew on Instagram at LA Brew Crew because the crew is definitely growing we want to make sure everybody finds out why the boys are going to dominate once again this season we're very excited about the boys getting ready to start the season here and play we're looking forward to recapping each week all of the games and we're going to do that for tomorrow's special edition show here on sporting area with myself Luke's, and the brute force brad weiss and we are here on the sports report the number one global sports show with our number one nhl analyst googs jake guggenheimer talking all the latest happenings in the world of the nhl and googs the new york islanders i mean it was the talk of social media we talked about the keys to this team and we brought up a player anthony beauvillier who was almost in witness protection for the first i'd say six weeks of the season maybe even seven weeks but all of a sudden he's got back-to-back games with overtime winning goals all of a sudden we look like geniuses and he looks like the player that we've seen flashes from the last couple of years that could be a pretty good player i mean jake maybe we should be talking about players all the time here on the show and maybe somebody's listening i give you the credit for that one time you're the one who pointed out Bavillier, but you know, that's huge for them. I mean, getting some production from Bavillier when, you know, you're missing your captain, Anders Lee. We talked about a lot of guys on that show. You know, we talked about Josh Bailey. We talked about JG Pajot. We talked about Matt Barzell. And, you know, you mentioned Andrew Bavillier at the end of the show, just mentioning how important he would be to this team. And all he does is go out and score two overtime game winners against you know, Philly and uh, the Bruins. And it's huge for them. I think um, that's definitely something that the Islanders need is a couple, you know, key scoring pieces to help them get, they make this playoff push. And they're putting themselves in a position, even without Andrews Lee, to, to really make a run for this Eastern Conference you know, title. So it's really fun to see. And, you know, I'm a Ranger fan, yes, but I, I like when New York hockey is doing well. I'm the same way with baseball and the Mets. I like when the Mets are doing well as well. And even though I'm a Yankee fan, so it's awesome to see. And it's cool to see them keep going, you know, despite missing one of the key cogs. You know, Jay, in sports, sometimes you ride the wave, you ride the momentum. And the Islanders might be riding a wave in momentum because if you think Think about where the Islanders have been for pretty much the last month or so in the standings. They've built themselves a cushion where even though Anders Lee is out for the rest of the season, and that's a significant loss, especially to the Islanders team, and I'd even say it's more of a loss off the ice than on the ice. The Islanders might be in a position to say, you know what? We've won all these games. I mean, we can do it. And the identity of this team, I think, has changed a lot with Barry Trotz, his coach, because if you think about the Islanders before with Doug wait at the end of the Jack Capuano days, a lot of these games, the Islanders have come from behind and won the last couple of years. They wouldn't have won them with Capuano and Wade as head coach. And maybe that's what that is. And you've been a great player. You've won championships. Do you think that that's something right now where the Islanders might just be kind of riding the wave here and riding momentum and that might just carry them through here, even with the loss of Anders Lee? hundred percent. I think sometimes when you, you know, you have a bunch of guys who really buy into a coach's system, that definitely serves uh, as a motivation factor, even when a guy goes down. So Barry Trotz has come in there and installed a, a very distinct personality with this team. And they're very hard nosed defensively. They're a good gritty team. And they've got a lot of pieces around on that team that contributing and they don't have a, you know, they have Matt Barzell, but even so he's got 25 points this year. They've got seven guys with 19 or more 
points. You know, they're just right behind the Rangers with guys who have you know, 20 plus points. So you, know, you have Josh Bailey, uh, Brock Nelson, who both have 19, and then you're obviously going to miss Anders Lee, but Oliver Wallstrom's right there with 16 as well. So they've got a very balanced attack. They are hard defensively. They don't give up many goals and, and they score when necessary. And that's exactly what you got to ask for from a team. And that's exactly the type of teams Barry Trotz likes to run. You know, he did that in Washington when they won the cup in 2018. That was their whole identity. They were defense and then they, Ovechkin scored and, and that was their whole big thing. So the Islanders aren't a team that's going to blow you out of the water with, you know, individual talent, but they're a very cohesive unit and it's really fun to watch them play hockey. They're good. They are very, very good. Absolutely. No question about it. And these grinded out Islander games and the team as a whole, their identity reminds me very similar to when I was growing up with the Knicks in the mid nineties under Pat Riley. And then later on Jeff Van Gundy, where they didn't quite have that one superstar Ewing and Barzell. I mean, Ewing might have a little more of an edge over Barzell in terms of offensive ability, but you kind of feel like there's similar teams in that sense where they're more cohesive as a team. They buy in. There's an identity. Defense, we can clearly see as the hallmark of the Islanders. Offensive production is up a little bit, but I think that's more about the league as a whole. But in terms of this Islanders team, you look at it and you say to yourself, Barzell, as you mentioned, 25 points. He's not in the top 10 or even in the top 20 in offensive production, but you've got a lot of guys around him that are just grinded out players. And you mentioned Josh Bailey and Brock Nelson. They've probably been the two biggest maligned Islanders players over the past decade. And yet, if you look at their numbers, they've actually been pretty good Islanders and they played well to their contracts that they were given. But let me ask you then this question when it comes to the Islanders. And we talked last week and they were coming off a devastating loss. And now they've come back to back overtime wins. And especially the Philadelphia game where they came back behind and they wound up stealing a game. And even Boston, you're down two goals early on, you come back and get a win. I mean, again, you've been a great player, played in a lot of great teams. Is it a team that you're starting? to say, you know what, maybe after all, this team is a Stanley Cup contender and maybe you don't tinker with it. Maybe you don't make the move. I mean, do you even feel like then the Islanders need to necessarily make that move and acquire a big name player, especially after winning games like they've won against good teams and like Boston, for example, maybe the Islanders don't even have to make a move. I mean, they don't have to do anything. I think they could write it out with what they've got, but I still think they should add an offensive piece. Why wouldn't you, you know, at this point, just take the load off Barzell who's kind of fallen out of Barry Trotz's favor a little bit. I mean, J.G. Pajot led their forwards in ice time tonight, like 18 minutes. So, you know, Barzell, he's been struggling a little bit. Maybe you want to bring in a piece just to solidify that offensive, you know, firepower. But I think the big note to make on the Islanders is their goaltending. I mean, Sorokin has been fantastic in the games he started. 8-2-1 with a 1.97 goals against and a 9.22 save percentage. I mean, Semyon Varlamov has not been too shabby either. 14-6-3 with a 2.2 goals against and a 9.23 save percentage. Percentage. That's where they're making their money here. They get really good goaltending. They have really solid defensemen. I think Pulak and Pella is one of the great young duos in the NHL, and it's really fun to watch them play. And then they're getting contributions from pretty much everyone in their lineup all the time. Josh Bailey scored tonight. JG Pajot scored tonight. Like these are things that you ask from a team, especially when you don't have that one superstar besides Barzell. So look, you definitely don't need to make a move. 100% you don't need to do that. But why wouldn't you if you have the opportunity to? Why wouldn't you if you can? They definitely have the pieces they can trade, but I wouldn't be surprised if they held steady and just said, let's go for it with what we've got now. I think this whole team is really bought into Barry Trotz and that's that's huge when it comes to team cohesiveness. If you have a coach you can play for, and I know that from my time playing sports as well, that that makes a, a world of difference. So, you know, maybe they don't make a move and they just continue this run. That would be really awesome to see, but I wouldn't be surprised if they did or didn't. I, I'm really not sure what their thoughts are coming up on the trade deadline, but we'll see when it gets there, you know? Absolutely. And we're not too far away from that. And we just went through the NBA trade deadline, which we talked with the brute force on. And I think the Islanders are in a very interesting position. And it's a position that the franchise hasn't been in too often, where they're in first place, a legitimate Stanley Cup contender. And if you make a move, you got a fan base that's craving an appearance to the Stanley Cup finals. The franchise is fine Finally tasted some success here these past couple of years and you, you kind of feel like you look at this team and maybe you make that move get that sniper get in that offensive player I mean they made the move last year with Pajot which helped somewhat but you're almost looking for that one other additional player not necessarily a Shifu but somebody in that 
type of range in that category because the Islanders have been kind of lacking that. You kind of wonder last year in the postseason when it came to the series against Carolina in 2019 and against Tampa Bay in the conference finals. You feel like almost that the Islanders were missing that offensive punch. And if the Islanders are going to return to the Stanley Cup for the first time since 1984, you might be looking at that here. And it's also a franchise that has not won a division title since 1988. So it's a franchise that has been starved for success and they look like they're on the cusp of it. So we'll certainly see what happens. But Jake, before we get your closing thoughts, one or two things the Islanders need to do here in order to continue the momentum. Yeah, I mean, I heard the Islanders were in on Dustin Brown a little bit of the LA Kings. And I think that would be a pretty good addition for them. I mean, he'd probably play on the third line with them, but you know, he's still a winger with some scoring talent. He's from New York. You know, he's kind of fallen out of favor in LA a little bit. You know, he had his captaincy taken away and that was given to, to Kopitar, but I would like that move for them if they can find a way to swing a trade for Dustin Brown. I think that would be a good trade for them. I think that would be a piece that they're missing who can provide some playoff experience. I mean, he's got those two Stanley Cups and countless playoff games with LA. So that might be a move that you see the Islanders make that I would actually really like. You know, for the Islanders, just keep doing what you're doing. Keep getting consistent offense from pretty much your entire team have that goaltending just really pick it up and continue to play fantastic hockey which both goalies have done I think you're going to see Sorokin start to really establish himself as the number one here but look I can't really point out a a true weakness on this team other than maybe the need for another skater another winger but hey I mean just keep doing what you're doing you guys have been great this year and it's really fun to watch especially from a you know an outsider's perspective when I don't have a vested interest in this team so we'll see what happens but I think the Islanders are in a really good position and I really would not be surprised if they continued uh, their success. Absolutely. And a player like Dustin Brown is the kind of player that this team might be lacking in a veteran player who off the ice can bring you some leadership, who's been in these big games. And it's a team, again, that hasn't had too many guys that have been in this situation. Nick Letty has won a Stanley Cup before, so you can certainly lean on him as an example, but it's a team by and large, Andy Green, you could throw in there that has some big Stanley Cup experience. But as a whole, you're looking for that next guy that veteran winger who's been there, been in the big game, knows how to win. That is certainly a target that I could certainly see the Islanders making a move on. And we're looking forward to talking about all the latest happens when it comes to the world of the Islanders and Rangers each and every week here with Googs, Jay Guggenheimer, our number one NHL analyst. And for you, my friend, I want to give you the floor. I can't thank you enough for all you do for us. You're an integral reason as to why we're the number one global sports show. So you know the drill, my friend, plug where let's just get in touch with you and the floor is yours. And I can't thank you enough. Yes, sir. Thank you, Tommy, for having me on. You know, another great week of talking about hockey. Again, thank you to all our frontline workers who are doing such a great job of fighting this pandemic and allowing us to get back to our somewhat normal lives. Shout out to the Brew Crew. We had our scrimmages last week. That was really fun. And you'll be hearing a little bit from Brad and I in a little bit, you know, talking about our recap of the games that we're going to play. And I'm really looking forward. I can't wait to get back on the field and just start playing some softball in this nice weather again. So in terms of where to reach me on social media, always on Instagram at Jake Guggenheimer 11 always on Twitter at JM Guggen. Please do reach out if you ever have any questions or you just want to talk some sports. I'm always in the mood to do that. I can't ever talk too much sports and I love getting the opportunity to do it on the sports report here with you, Tom. So, you know, looking forward to a really good uh, a week of hockey coming up. Uh, we got some big games for both the Islanders and the Rangers and we'll get back to it next week. But just one quick thing, you know, who the Islanders have in, in the AHL, if they ever do decide to call them up again, who also has Stanley Cup experiences and your lad. I He's knew that was coming, Jake. Down. I knew that was coming. <laughs> he's, he's been down in Bridgeport just kind of hanging out doing doing his thing but that guy's got two Stanley Cups under his belt too one with Carolina one with uh, Chicago if they need a veteran presence they want to plug in on that fourth line and they need some playoff experience you know Andrew Ladd is your man so let's see what happens um, I think it's going to be quite an interesting trade deadline for the NHL that's coming up soon so we'll see if either of these teams make any moves and yeah we'll uh, talk about it next week Tom Jake, Andrew Ladd is probably the most maligned player maybe in Islanders history and he got a big contract he replaced Kyle Oposo and Franz Nielsen and he did score 20 plus goals that first year but he got off to such a terrible start and that feels like 20 years ago and he's actually in the fifth year of that contract I mean my god it's one of the worst contract signings in New York sports history I mean he's really done very little but the back of his hockey card would tell you that he would fit that description but I don't know if the Islander fan base could take Andrew 
glad in the lineup. I know Thomas Hickey came back and he actually has done something for the team. So that is actually a positive. He's got two points in three games. He's actually played very well, but I don't know about Andrew Ladd. So that might be a conversation we'll have for another day. And I'm sure Islander fans mm-hmm. were looking for Pepto Bismo after they heard the name Andrew Ladd. So we'll certainly <laughs> see what happens when it comes to Mr. Ladd and the rest of the team, as well as the Rangers. And congratulations on getting back on the field. Looking forward to recapping some brew crew with you and the brute force in a little while and we'll speak with you soon. Yes, sir. Looking forward to it. Have a great rest of the day, Tom. As we're here on the Sports Report, the number one global sports show with our number one NFL and NHL analyst, and that's Googs, Jake Guggenheimer of our LI Brew Crew. We started the season here. We're looking forward to in a little while recapping week one with the brute force, Brad Weiss and Googs, Jake Guggenheimer, as I am the host of the Sports Report, the Reverend Tom Bryson. Stay tuned for more hard-hitting analysis here on Sportinarium as we talk with our longest tenured analyst, that's her own Rob Morosco, talking all the latest happenings here in the world, Major League Baseball. And we're here on Sportinarium, the number one global radio station, as we're just with Googs, Jake Guggenheimer, the LA Brew Crew, talking all the latest happenings in the world of the NHL. As I am the host of the Sports Report, the Reverend Tom Bryson. Stay tuned for our longest tenured analyst on the Sports Report, Rob Morosco, to talk all the latest happenings here in the world of Major League Baseball on Sportinarium. As we're here on the Sports Report, the number one global sports show with our longest tenured analyst, and that's our number one analyst for all the latest happenings in the world of Major League Baseball, and that's our own Rob Morosco. My friend, how are you? Hey, Tom. It's great to be back on. How are you? Always good to speak with you, my friend, and we're almost there. We're right there at the finish line, opening day. We're about a week away or so from opening day, so we're very excited about that. If you would have asked us maybe three or four months ago, we didn't think we were going to get to this day. Even two months ago, I would say I don't think we thought that the season was going to start on time and we were going to have an opening day. And even in most cities, we're going to see fans of anywhere between 10% and 25% capacity. In some cities, they're even going to have near full capacity. So obviously it's a lot of work has been done with this and we want to congratulate everybody that has made it happen, especially the players and Major League Baseball as a whole. But Mr. Morosco, before we get into all the latest happenings in the world of Major League Baseball, and there's a lot to get into, especially now with opening day next week. Since we last spoke, you were once again on our friends over at Reckless Airwaves Radio and talk about that for appearance number two here for our worldwide audience on Sporting Area. Yes, they had back on for appearance number two. And I'll tell you, it was an awesome segment. I want to thank the guys at Reckless Airwaves Radio for having not only me, but the rest of the sports report on Sportinarium team on. It was like Sportinarium week last week on uh, <laughs> Reckless Airwaves Radio, you know? We took over the airwaves for a while. We certainly did. And obviously, shout outs to Googs, Jake Guggenheimer, the honorable MC here in the stub. And we understand that the brute force Brad Weiss is going to be on in the near distant future. So I want to make sure everybody follows once again reckless airwaves on twitter at reckless airwaves at reckless airwave and also go to recklessairwaves.com for all the latest shows all show information and all the great things related to the reckless airwaves lineup so that's once again on twitter at reckless airwave that's at reckless airwave where you can follow reckless airwaves for all the latest updates and who knows maybe mr morosky will be on for a third time maybe we'll see Googs for a second time and who knows what else is in store especially when it comes to the honorable i'm and stuff in the brute for us, Rad Weiss. But Mr. Morasca, to kick things off when it comes to getting ready for opening day here, and there's a player that we've talked about on the show over the past several weeks, and we talked about him with the Honorable M. Sierra Stubb and former Philadelphia Phillies organization star Craig Holman. And that's the case of Matt Harvey. And Matt Harvey is once again trying for a comeback. He's with the Orioles. And last two thoughts, Mr. Morasca, I have to say, he is making a case if he'll be on the Orioles opening day roster so so far now that we're almost over with spring training we're getting ready for opening day for a worldwide audience listening here on sporting area what do you think things stand with the dark knight matt harvey well i think that he's having a pretty good spring right now with the baltimore orioles in fact he's looking pretty good he looks like he might make a team and you know what baltimore is not going to be that good this year so why not it gives him a chance to come back who knows what's going to happen in fact last weekend he pitched against the Yankees and they were very impressed with him. He gave up one home run and that was the only run he gave up in four innings. Struck out a couple of batters and you know that was his best spring training start. Ex-Met teammate Jay Bruce was impressed with his 
former teammate. He said he looks good, hopes he stays healthy, and makes the team after some bumps in the road. He looks like he is back on track. So maybe the Dark Knight is back on track, Tom. He very well might be. And that was the only home run he gave up Saturday's game. Gio Urshela hit a home run off Matt Harvey in the second inning. But if you look at his last two starts, ladies and gentlemen, eight innings pitched, six hits, three runs, a walk, and six strikeouts. When we spoke a few weeks ago with the Honorable MC Ernest Dove and Craig Holman, we were almost convinced as if we were getting ready to say goodnight to Matt Harvey and his career. And we didn't really take this serious. But Mr. Moraska, these last two starts, once again, eight innings pitched, six hits, three runs, a walk, and six strikeouts. I mean, this sounds like somebody who still might have something left. He might have something left. Let's face it. He's not the dark knight anymore. He's not throwing pitches over 100 miles per hour, but he was in the 91 to 93 mile per hour range on Saturday against the Yankees, and he did strike out two batters. So that's not bad considering what's been going on with him since the Mets released him in 2018. Let me tell you, he finished that season with the Reds, and then after that, he posted a 7.82 ERA in 19 appearances appearances for the Angels and Royals. So, I mean, think about that. 7.82 ERA. All right. The injury derailed him, but maybe it was also his attitude. So Matt Harvey, we've seen the back of his baseball card since the 2015 World Series. And for the most part, it's been pretty bad. You look at his last start here this past Saturday, where Yankees go one for 13 against him. He goes four innings, gives up the one home run to Rochella and the one hit. He strikes out two and only has one walk. And we know that control has been a problem for the Dark Knight these past few years. He's got one more start, most likely, between now and opening day. Is Matt Harvey somebody you think that's going to be on the Baltimore Orioles roster come opening day? I think he has a good shot at it. You know what? Why not? Baltimore should probably take a chance on it. If his final start of the spring is as good as his last two, then I think he will make the team. Baltimore is not going anywhere this year. They're in a tough division, and that division is going to be run by the Yankees and the Toronto Blue Jays. So, you know, Baltimore is not really going anywhere. So they might want to take a chance with Harvey. Maybe they'll get some magic. Let's say he doesn't make the roster. From what you've seen so far, far in Matt Harvey. Do you think he's done enough to get another shot with somebody else in case he doesn't make the roster with the Orioles? Well, you know what? Maybe an injury, someone goes down and, you know, they take a chance on Harvey. I guess it's all going to depend on maybe this last start of spring, but why not? You know, you never know. Maybe he goes, I don't know what's going to happen if he doesn't make the major league team for Baltimore, but you know what? You never know. And could you imagine if maybe he hands on the Yankees if there's some injuries. You know the Yankees, they love going after X-Mets. Is it possible also that let's say he doesn't make the team that maybe he would start the year in AAA? I mean, because you know what? That's a better option than not being on any roster at all. And if you look at the first month of the season, you do have injuries. You do have a lot of games that could be postponed due to inclement weather. And you have a number of different scenarios that are in play. I mean, let's say he doesn't make the roster, but he's sort of in one of these standby situations. I mean, if you're Matt Harvey, would you accept that? I would. I mean, what else has he got going on then? Of course I would. I mean, that would be his best chance to get back into the major leagues. I mean, right now, Matt Harvey doesn't have too many choices. So if he does not make the Baltimore Orioles major league team, if he doesn't make the big club, his best bet would be to go into AAA and then just see what happens. I think one thing we've seen, ladies and gentlemen, is that we probably have not seen the last of Matt Harvey one way or the other. We had talked, once again, a lot with Ernest and Craig Holman about this, and we almost kind of felt like this was going to be the last we've heard from the Dark Knight. But I think so far from what we've seen from him at his spring training is that he still has something left. So regardless if he doesn't make the roster with the Orioles, we got a good feeling we're going to see him either in AAA or most likely somebody else will give him a shot. So Matt Harvey, I think, has proven himself. 
he's proven us wrong here on the show, and he very well may still have something left. And Mr. Baraska, as we're getting ready for opening day here, what are some news and notes you have when it comes to the Mets as they get ready to start the season? Well, you know what? The Mets, to me, like I said last week on Reckless Airwaves Radio, I gave my uh, preview of the Mets, Yankees, and the uh, division winners. And you know what? I think the Mets are looking pretty good. I think they have, they're having a good spring. The most thing I'm worried about is the defense, okay? I'm not even worried about the bullpen. I think the bullpen's going to be all right. I think Diaz is probably going to have a comeback year. And then what you've seen out of Francisco Lindo so far, I mean, Mr. Marasca, we talked about this with the Honorable Ems here and stuff. I got to think the Mets are going to have to lay out a lot of money between now and opening day and get that done as soon as possible when it comes to re-signing Francisco Lindo. Well, I think that is something that they have to do. We all want to see them sign him, give him a contract, and do it before the start of the season because I don't think he's going to negotiate during the season. So let's get it done. So far, so good. He's great in the clubhouse. The players love him. He loves playing baseball. He always has a smile on his face. He brings a lot of energy to this club. Hey, he's hit a couple of home runs the past couple of games. He's looking really good. He's a team leader, and his teammates love him. And you know what? The Mets better sign him. Are you worried now with the injury of Carlos Carrasco for the rest of the Met rotation? We talked prior and we were very optimistic about the depth of this Met rotation. But now without Carrasco for a certain amount of time here, the Mets are going to have to tread water. I mean, how do you feel about the rotation right now? I think they could do it. I mean, that's a blow. And, you know, that's typical Mets, of course. That's going to (laughs) happen. Nothing's changed even with new ownership but except for the attitude i think the attitude is better i think they're deep i think the grom's gonna have another excellent year now Syndergaard, let's see what happens when he gets back be pitching for a contract also so i think once he comes back from the injury i think he's gonna pitch pretty good and when it comes to the back end of the rotation what's your thoughts here because we're assuming that it's going to be Degrom, stroman and then we have taiwan walker we have jordan yeah Yamamoto, and then we have Joey Lucchese. I mean, what's your thoughts here when it comes to the rest of the Met rotation? Yeah, I think Lucchese is going to be the fifth starter. I think that, you know what, the Mets went out and they got some pitchers. I think they're going to go out there and battle. And you know what, I think it's going to be interesting. I think they're going to work hard and I really see some depth in this pitching staff and I'm not really that worried. And David Peterson, what do you think he plays into all of this? You know what? We love seeing him last year, and I can't wait to see him pitch on the big ball club again. I think he has a great future with the Mets. I really do. I like what I saw last year, and I'm excited about him still. What's the one key for this team right now going into opening day? Okay, the key with the Mets is not to dig themselves into a hole early in the season. Okay, last year was a weird season. It was just too much, and, you know, they were disappointing. They really never turned it on at all. It just wasn't a good season. They didn't make the extended playoffs, which this year there are no extended playoffs. So they have to play good baseball in April and May. Let's hope everyone's healthy, all the teams, so that we don't have any COVID stoppage, because that would really not be good and they just have to play baseball they've been looking good in spring training and like i said on uh, reckless airwaves radio i think they could win the division this year no question that the mets will have more expectations than usual and the achilles heel for this met team prior to this past season especially in 2018 and 2019 was the month of june i mean mr morosca if you took away the month of june from the mets they probably would have been a playoff team certainly in 2019 So we know one thing, that month of June, I think, is the month that we're going to watch very closely here when it comes to the Mets season. And then, Mr. Maraska, you had something for our worldwide audience, you know, Swinerium here, that was very interesting when it comes to some notable moments in Met history. Yeah, since we're taping this on March 23rd, I just checked out some moments in Mets history for March 23rd. And in 1978, Mets traded Bud Harrelson to the Phillies for minor leaguer 
Freddie Andrews and 50 grand. I just want to say he wanted to be traded because he felt that he was no longer in the Mets plans. The Mets really, they had Doug Flynn. They didn't need two light hitting infielders. So they wanted to get rid of him anyway. But he had seniority. He could have blocked any trade. So he gave the Mets a couple of teams like the Phillies, the Red Sox, and the Yankees who we would go to. And they traded him to the Phillies. So that was one of the last pieces of the uh, Miracle Mets to go. But Harrelson. You know, and it was sad to see him go, but he actually was ready to leave the Mets. No question that Bud Harrelson is an important part to Met history and the only Met to have appeared in the 69 World Series championship team, the 73 team that went to the World Series, and as a coach, the 86 team that had won the World Series. So a very interesting fact when it comes to the career of Bud Harrelson. And then were there a few other things that our worldwide audience would be very curious on when it comes to Met? history? Yes, in 2007, and I like this signing, they signed Fernando to teach three years on the Mets. He hit 279 with 21 home runs and 101 RBIs. You know what? A lot of people said ah, that he was finished by that time, but I think it was pretty exciting when he was on the Mets. Yeah, he definitely had some big moments. He was a guy that, if you looked at it, was thought of for that one game where he had two grand slams in one inning and a couple of big moments with the Cardinals, but unfortunately didn't live up to those early years he had. And he kind of had a second life with the Mets. So I think that there's no question that he had some big moments for the Mets, especially in the 2008 season. And then anything else for a worldwide audience? Well, in 2017, Asdrubal Cabrera was ejected from a spring training game by Angel Hernandez because he was not given time out, but he took it anyway. I don't know if you remember that. <laughs> I, I just found out that when it happened. Yeah, listen, <laughs> Angel, Hernandez, Angel Hernandez is a very controversial umpire in baseball history for a couple of different things. So I'm not surprised one bit when it comes to Angel Hernandez in the center of something, Mr. Marasca. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but that's basically what I have. I just thought it'd be fun to look back at a couple of moments from this date. Well, I'll tell you one thing, ladies and gentlemen, we're looking forward to some upcoming moments in Met history, and we're going to talk about all of those happenings on the Sports Report, the number one global sports show with the longest tenure analyst, and that's our own Rob Maraska, as I am the host of the Sports Report, the Reverend Tom Bryson. For more information on the Sports Report, you can go to sportsreportx.com and to listen to all of our archives, you can go to soundcloud.com slash the Sports Report 2019 and now go on our YouTube page by subscribing subscribing to at the sports report the number one global sports show where you can see all of our sunday shows with mr maraska Googs, jake guggenheimer and the brute force brad weiss along with several other sports report related clips and all other information related to the show and also as always a huge shout out to the entire team here at sportarium including lakey Arv, sean who does a phenomenal job with the youtube page at sportarium tv where you can subscribe to sports report and others great content martin connor dave dale Susie, Sasha, Mike Lip. Hinsky, who does a phenomenal job with the In the Fight show, a who's who of people here at Sportinary that make us the number one global sports show. So that's why we want to always make sure we recognize everybody here at Sportinary. And you can follow Sportinary on Twitter and Instagram at Sportinary. You can like Sportinary on Facebook at Sportinary Media. And you can, once again, as we just alluded to, subscribe to the Sportinary TV YouTube page at Sportinary TV, where you can see a who's who of content, including several of the most recent sports report interviews. So you know what you need to do. You need to go to Sportinarium TV and subscribe. And of course, can't leave out the fact that the sports report is on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays, 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern time, 10 p.m. to 12 a.m. UK time on Sportinarium.com. That's Sportinarium.com, Fridays. Saturdays and Sundays, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 10 p.m. to 12 a.m. UK Time. <laughs> sports Report on Sportinarium.com. And of course, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. You can listen to Sportinarium content amongst the many other great shows, including All That Racket, In The Fight, The Spartan Show, A Who's Who of People. And also, we just announced September 4th, Sportinarium is promoting and presenting our first fight on behalf of the station's history. So we're very excited about that. 
We know the entire team is going to be out there. And also shout out to DJ 80 with the Sunday chill out show. Cannot forget about 80. Of course, I cut a promo for him. Richie as well. A who's who of people here in Sporting Area. And also speaking of a who's who of people, huge shout out to the legendary Joe Dell. You can go to joe-dell.com for all of your virtual keyboard and piano lessons. And of course, right after myself and Mr. Morasca go off there, you can get over 20 minutes of the legendary Joe Dell and Sleepy Hollow's content. So if you like it hard, you like it heavy, you like it loud, you stay tuned because Joe Dell and Sleepy Hollow are going to bring you some of the best music around. And make sure you go to joe-dell.com for all of your virtual keyboard and piano lessons. He's one of the best in the business, one of our biggest supporters. We want to make sure that we recognize him. And we are here on the Sports Report, the number one local sports show with our longest tenured analyst. And that's our own Rob Maraska talking all the latest happenings in the world of Major League Baseball. Mr. Maraska, we've talked quite a bit about some of the past. We've talked quite a bit about the present. And we've talked quite a bit about the future. But now that we know some of the news and notes about what's going on, I was curious because there was something that you wanted to share for a worldwide audience listening here on Sportinarium most especially because NBC Sports did a poll recently and talk about this poll why it's important and what do you think the ramifications are for it when it comes to the major league baseball season here in 2021 Okay, well, they're going to let fans back into the ballpark, we know. So NBC Sports did a poll of all the uh, ballparks from 1 to 30, from best to worst, and they gave a rating. And, you know, there's a little little explanation. So I figured I pulled out the top three and the bottom three. And then I'll also real quickly mention about the Mets and the Yankees, City Field and Yankee Stadium. But I'm not going to get into that in depth because we're going to do that on another show. Okay, so give us the top three, best and worst, and what can we expect when it comes to 2021 for the season? Okay, well, I'll start with the worst ballpark in the major leagues, Tropicana Field in Florida, home of the Rays. (laughs) I'll tell you something. It it could hold 31,042 fans, and the only time it's held that was for the playoffs in the World Series. During the regular season, get it. They need a new stadium. They've been playing here for 20 years. And just think about it. The white domed roof, retractable roof, is the biggest eyesore you could imagine. And it looks terrible with all the rows of empty seats surrounding the field. So that is the worst stadium to watch baseball in, Tom. Mr. Maraska, in the 90s, Tropicana Field looked old and it looked like an eyesore. So 20 years later, it looks even worse. And social distancing, I don't think, applies when it comes to Tropicana Field because they never reach 31,000 independents. <laughs> they don't have to worry about social distancing. They don't have to worry about mask wearing because they're never going to sell out that place. So even the World Series couldn't sell out Tropicana Field. So obviously, listen, they don't have to worry about any of those regulations, any of those rules. So I could certainly see why that is the worst ballpark in all of baseball. That's a no-brainer, but who's number two on the list? I just want to say quick, I also have a few quick things about the food served there, and they do serve something called a short-ribbed grilled cheese sandwich that's supposed to be pretty good, so maybe people just go there for the sandwich. I don't know. Number 29 would be the Oakland Coliseum. Now, that opened in 1966. It holds 35,067 people people. It's in better shape now that the A's don't have to share it with the Raiders, but it's still a poor facility. It's old, it's ugly, and even though it has a lot of history, it's just a dump in Oakland. But wait, there is hope. The team hopes to open a new stadium on the edge of San Francisco Bay by 2023. So there's some hope in Oakland, but the Coliseum is very old, very big, and it doesn't look that great. Yeah, the Coliseum, even again, another ballpark that 20 years ago or 25 years ago always looked old and I know that they don't share the stadium with the Raiders anymore but that was always to me never a great place on TV to watch a game it never looked like an experience that was really for the fan it just didn't look like a place you'd want to play a game I mean so I could easily see why that's second on the list so then who's third well I just want to say that they said even the food isn't exciting at the Coliseum they just serve the basic hot dogs chicken tenders ballpark food nothing fancy there okay number 28 of the worst stadiums in the major leagues 
would be in Chicago, the White Sox. And that was built in 1991, guaranteed rate field. Yep. That could hold 40,615. But they even had bad timing when they opened the place because it opened a year before Camden Yards. And we know how beautiful Camden yep. Yards is in Baltimore. Okay, yep. guaranteed rate field, which that's another thing with these ballparks. They're sponsored now, so they keep changing the names, which just drives me crazy. I know it's business, but you know, I liked when the stadiums had just one name and they didn't change the name all the time. You know, that's just annoying. But it's a huge stadium with symmetrical dimensions. It's already old and it opened, like I said, in 1991. And it doesn't have a view of Chicago. It actually has a view of the housing projects that are next to the Dan <laughs> Ryan Express. You can't, you can't even look out the stadium and see, you know, some buildings in Chicago. You see the projects. But there is a plus. They have have something there called boozy hot chocolate. It's Patron toasted marshmallow syrup and it's supposed to be delicious. So I guess they go there to watch the White Sox, which are going to have a pretty good team this year, and have some hits of that boozy hot chocolate. So that'll help them with the view. Everything looks good after a couple of those. That ballpark was the first of the new 90s parks. And you mentioned Camden Yards was another one, Coors Field, Jacobs Field, the ballpark at Arlington. There were a number of these parks that all came around the same time. And the first one was then Comiskey Park. Yeah. So you can certainly see why that park has become outdated because it's 30 years ago now. So obviously I could certainly see why that was on the list. And I kind of thought in my head that was going to be in the top five. I wasn't quite sure if it was going to be number three, but I could certainly see why based on where we are and fan experience and how long the park has been in existence, I could certainly see why it's number three. And then on the flip side, conversely, very quickly, give us a top three very quickly. Okay, PNC Park in Pittsburgh opened in 20. 20- 1 could hold 38,362. They say it's as close to a perfect ballpark as you can get. An unmatched view of downtown Pittsburgh, Roberto Clemente Bridge. It has seating with only two decks, so you're really close to the action. And it has something to eat there called the Pittsburgh Cone. It's kielbasa, pierogi, Swiss cheese, sauerkraut, Russian dressing, and a waffle cone. So maybe you might go there to try that because Pittsburgh's not too exciting to watch. Yeah, the Pirates have been a bad ball club pretty much now for a generation, except for the early part of the 2010s. And then give us number two and three very quickly. Okay, number two, Wrigley Field, opened in 1914, seats 41,072. We know what it's all about, the friendly confines of Wrigley Field. It does have some obstructive views because it was built way back then, but the good outweighs the bad. A great summer day at Wrigley Field, nothing beats that, the Ivy the manual scoreboard and of course the great baseball experience and the rooftops and they have great food there too and number one dodger stadium opened in 1962 56,000 seats yet people arrive there late and leave early even though it has great scenic views two jumbotrons huge stadium stank concourses okay they are close to the action in dodger stadium but they still leave early and those dodger dogs Tom, you know, yeah, those, they always those, talk about those Dodgers. Those Dodger dogs are very good friend Joe Rosas, who has been to Dodger Stadium many times, raves about that ballpark, and he has been there, and he thinks it's a great experience to go watch a ball game in. So I could certainly see why Dodger Stadium is in the top of the list here. And then before we get your closing thoughts, give us where City Field and Yankee Stadium rank. Okay, City Field is ranked number ten, and Yankee Stadium is ranked number eight. I could certainly see where they are. They're newer ballparks now, and I think that the experience at both ballparks has definitely come a long way from what Shea and the old Yankee Stadium had to say. I think if we would have did this poll maybe 15 years ago, Mr. Morosca, I think that the old Shea Stadium and Yankee Stadium probably would have been in the bottom 10. I don't think they would have been in the bottom five, but they probably would have been in the bottom 10. So it's a great list. Hopefully our worldwide audience can get out there to a ball game somewhere at some point. I don't know if it's going to be this year 
year, but certainly next year, those are some places that you might want to visit. And I would obviously want to throw Fenway Park in there as an honorable mention. I think San Francisco is a great place to watch a ball game. Also, St. Louis's Park. There's a lot of great ballparks. We'll see if this list changes over next year. We're looking forward to covering all the latest happenings in the world of baseball with our longest tenured analyst, and that's our own Rob Moroster. And for you, my friend, I want to give you the floor. I want to give any closing thoughts. As always, plug where let's just get in touch with you. And you know the drill, my friend. The floor is yours. Yep, they could get in touch with me at R Maraska on Twitter and Rob Maraska on Facebook. Follow me, I'll follow you. And I'll tell you, I just can't wait for baseball to start. It'll be here before we know it. Absolutely. And a rising tide lifts all boats and Major League Baseball and everybody involved in it has definitely been that rising tide that has gotten us to where we are today. And we're looking forward to watching some baseball on April Fool's Day, no less. So obviously, we certainly hope it's not going to be an April Fool's like day for the Mets. Well, the Mets in the past have been very good historically on opening days. So we'll hope that continues and we'll prepare for the season next week with you, my friend, and preview where we are along with the rest of the team here on the Sports Report. And looking forward to it, my friend. Can't thank you enough. And we'll speak with you next week. Talk to you next week. As we're here on the Sports Report, the number one global sports show with our longest tenured analyst, and that's our own Rob Maroska, as I am the host of the Sports Report, the Reverend Tom Bryce, and stay tuned for you asked for it, ladies and gentlemen. Some brand new music from the legendary Joe Dell and Sleepy Hollow, over 20 minutes worth. So if you like it hard, you like it heavy, you like it loud, we got the best from the legendary Joe Dell and Sleepy Hollow. Stay tuned for that, and we are here on Sportinarium, the number one global radio station. We just with our longest tenure analyst on the Sports Report, and that's her own Rob Maraska, and I am the host of the Sports Report, the Reverend Tom Bryson. Buckle your seatbelts because we have now the legendary Joe Dell and Sleepy Hollow, so stay tuned for that here on Sporting Area.